This is section 17 of the $30,000 bequest by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Curious Book Complete Part 1 The foregoing review of the great work of G. Ragsdale McClintock is liberally illuminated with sample extracts, but these cannot appease the appetite. Only the complete book, unabridged, can do that. Therefore, it is here printed. M. T. THE ENEMY CONQUERED, OR LOVE TRIUMPHANT Sweet girl, thy smiles are full of charms, thy voice is sweeter still, it fills the breast with fond alarms, echoed by every rill. I begin this little work with an eulogy upon woman, who has ever been distinguished for her perseverance, her constancy, and her devoted attention to those upon whom she has been pleased to place her affections. Many have been the themes upon which writers and public speakers have dwelt with intense and increasing interest. Among these delightful themes stands that of woman, the balm to all our sighs and disappointments, and the most preeminent of all other topics. Here the poet and orator have stood and gazed with wonder and with admiration. They have dwelt upon her innocence, the ornament of all her virtues first viewing her external charms, such as are set forth in her form and benevolent countenance, and then passing to the deep-hidden springs of loveliness and disinterested devotion. In every clime and in every age she has been the pride of her nation. Her watchfulness is untiring. She who guarded the sepulchre was the first to approach it, and the last to depart from its awful yet sublime scene even here in this highly favored land we look to her for the security of our institutions and for our future greatness as a nation but strange as it may appear woman's charms and virtues are but slightly appreciated by thousands those who should raise the standard of female worth and paint her value with her virtues in living colors upon the banners that are fanned by the zephyrs of heaven and hand them down to posterity as emblematical of a rich inheritance, do not properly estimate them. Man is not sensible at all times of the nature and the emotions which bear that name. He does not understand, he will not comprehend. His intelligence has not expanded to that degree of glory which drinks in the vast revolution of humanity, its end, its mighty destination, and the causes which operated and are still operating to produce a more elevated station, and the objects which energize and enliven its consummation. This he is a stranger to. He is not aware that woman is the recipient of celestial love, and that man is dependent upon her to perfect his character, that without her, philosophically and truly speaking, the brightest of his intelligence is but the coldest of a winter moon, whose beams can produce no fruit, whose solar light is not its own, but borrowed from the great dispenser of effulgent beauty. We have no disposition in the world to flatter the fair sex. We would raise them above those dastardly principles which only exist in little souls, contracted hearts, and a distracted brain. Often does she unfold herself in all her fascinating loveliness, presenting the most captivating charms. Yet we find man frequently treats such purity of purpose with indifference. Why does he do it? Why does he baffle that which is inevitably the source of his better days? Is he so much of a stranger to those excellent qualities as not to appreciate woman, as not to have respect to her dignity? Since her art and beauty first captivated man, she has been his delight and his comfort. She has shared alike in his misfortunes and in his prosperity. Whenever the billows of adversity and the tumultuous waves of trouble beat high, her smiles subdue their fury. Should the tear of sorrow and the mournful sigh of grief interrupt the peace of his mind, her voice removes them all, and she bends from her circle to encourage him onward. When darkness would obscure his mind, and a thick cloud of gloom would bewilder its operations, her intelligent eye darts a ray of streaming light into his heart. 
mighty and charming is that disinterested devotion which she is ever ready to exercise toward man not waiting till the last moment of his danger but seeks to relieve him in his early afflictions it gushes forth from the expansive fullness of a tender and devoted heart where the noblest the purest and the most elevated and refined feelings are matured and developed in those many kind offices which invariably make her character in the room of sorrow and sickness this unequalled characteristic may always be seen in the performance of the most charitable acts nothing that she can do to promote the happiness of him who she claims to be her protector will be omitted all is invigorated by the animating sunbeams which awaken the heart to songs of gaiety leaving this point to notice another prominent consideration which is generally one of great moment and of vital importance invariably she is firm and steady in all her pursuits and aims there is required a combination of forces and extreme opposition to drive her from her position she takes her stand not to be moved by the sound of apollo's lyre or the curved bow of pleasure firm and true to what she undertakes and that which she requires by her own aggrandizement and regards as being within the strict rules of propriety she will remain stable and unflinching to the last a more genuine principle is not to be found in the most determined resolute heart of man for this she deserves to be held in the highest commendation for this she deserves the purest of all other blessings and for this she deserves the most laudable reward of all others it is a noble characteristic and is worthy of imitation of any age and when we look at it in one particular aspect it is still magnified and grows brighter and brighter the more we reflect upon its eternal duration what will she not do when her word as well as her affections and love are pledged to her lover everything that is dear to her on earth all the hospitalities of kind and loving parents all the sincerity and loveliness of sisters and the benevolent devotion of brothers who have surrounded her with every comfort she will forsake them all quit the harmony and sweet sound of the lute and the harp and throw herself upon the affections of some devoted admirer in whom she fondly hopes to find more than she has left behind which is not often realized by many truth and virtue all combined how deserving our admiration and love ah cruel would it be in man after she has thus manifested such an unshaken confidence in him and said by her determination to abandon all the endearments and blandishments of home to act a villainous part and prove a traitor in the revolution of his mission and then turn hector over the innocent victim whom he swore to protect in the presence of heaven recorded by the pen of an angel striking as this train may unfold itself in her character and as preeminent as it may stand among the fair display of her other qualities yet there is another which struggles into existence and adds an additional lustre to what she already possesses i mean that disposition in woman which enables her in sorrow in grief and in distress to bear all with enduring patience this she has done and can and will do amid the din of war and clash of arms scenes and occurrences which to every appearance are calculated to rend the heart with the profoundest emotions of trouble do not fetter that exalted principle imbued in her very nature it is true her tender and feeling heart may often be moved as she is thus constituted but she is not conquered she has not given up to the harlequin of disappointments her energies have not become clouded in the last movement of misfortune but she is continually invigorated by the archetype of her affections she may bury her face in her hands and let the tear of anguish roll she may promenade the delightful walks of some garden decorated with all the flowers of nature or she may steal out along some gently rippling stream and there as the silver waters uninterruptedly move forward shed her silent tears they mingle with the waters and take a last farewell of their agitated home to seek a peaceful dwelling among the rolling floods 
yet there is a voice rushing from her breast that proclaims victory along the whole line and battlement of her affections that voice is the voice of patience and resignation that voice is one that bears everything calmly and dispassionately amid the most distressing scenes when the fates are arrayed against her peace and apparently plotting for her destruction still she is resigned woman's affections are deep consequently her troubles may be made to sink deep although you may not be able to mark the traces of her grief and the furrowings of her anguish upon her winning countenance yet be assured they are nevertheless preying upon her inward person sapping the very foundation of that heart which alone was made for the weal and not the woe of man the deep recesses of the soul are fields for their operation but they are not destined simply to take the regions of the heart for their dominion they are not satisfied merely with interrupting her better feelings but after a while you may see the blooming cheek beginning to droop and fade her intelligent eye no longer sparkles with the starry light of heaven her vibrating pulse long since changed its regular motion and her palpitating bosom beats once more for the midday of her glory anxiety and care ultimately throw her into the arms of the haggard and grim monster death but oh how patient under every pining influence let us view the matter in bolder colors see her when the dearest object of her affections recklessly seeks every bacchanalian pleasure contents himself with the last rubbish of creation with what solicitude she awaits his return sleep fails to perform its office she weeps while the nocturnal shades of the night triumph in the stillness bending over some favorite book whilst the author throws before her mind the most beautiful imagery she startles at every sound the midnight silence is broken by the solemn announcement of the return of another morning he is still absent she listens for that voice which has so often been greeted by the melodies of her own but alas stern silence is all that she receives for her vigilance mark her unwearied watchfulness as the night passes away at last brutalized by the accursed thing he staggers along with rage and shivering with cold he makes his appearance not a murmur is heard from her lips on the contrary she meets him with a smile she caresses him with tender arms with all the gentleness and softness of her sex here then is seen her disposition beautifully arrayed woman thou art more to be admired than the spicy gales of arabia and more sought for than the gold of golconda we believe that woman should associate freely with man and we believe that it is for the preservation of her rights she should become acquainted with the metaphysical designs of those who condescend to sing the siren song of flattery this we think should be according to the unwritten law of decorum which is stamped upon every innocent heart the precepts of prudery are often steeped in the guilt of contamination which blasts the expectations of better moments truth and beautiful dreams loveliness and delicacy of character with cherished affections of the ideal woman gentle hopes and aspirations are enough to uphold her in the storms of darkness without the transferred colorings of a stained sufferer how often have we seen it in our public prints that woman occupies a false station in the world and some have gone so far as to say it was an unnatural one so long has she been regarded a weak creature by the rabble and illiterate they have looked upon her as an insufficient actress on the great stage of human life a mere puppet to fill up the drama of human existence a thoughtless inactive being that she has too often come to the same conclusion herself and has sometimes forgotten her high destination in the meridian of her glory we have but little sympathy or patience for those who treat her as a mere rosy melindy who are always fishing for pretty compliments who are satisfied by the gossamer of romance and who can be allured by the verbosity of high-flown words rich in language but poor and barren in sentiment beset as she has been by the intellectual vulgar the selfish the designing the cunning the hidden and the artful 
no wonder she has sometimes folded her wings in despair and forgotten her heavenly mission in the delirium of imagination no wonder she searches out some wild desert to find a peaceful home but this cannot always continue a new era is moving gently onward old things are rapidly passing away old superstitions old prejudices and old notions are now bidding farewell to their old associates and companions and giving way to one whose wings are plumed with the light of heaven and tinged by the dews of the morning there is a remnant of blessedness that clings to her in spite of all evil influence there is enough of the divine master left to accomplish the noblest work ever achieved under the canopy of the vaulted skies and that time is fast approaching when the picture of the true woman will shine from its frame of glory to captivate to win back to restore and to call into being once more the objects of her mission star of the brave thy glory shed o'er all the earth thy army led bold meteor of immortal birth why come from heaven to dwell on earth mighty and glorious are the days of youth happy the moments of the lover mingled with smiles and tears of his devoted and long to be remembered are the achievements which he gains with a palpitating heart and a trembling hand a bright and lovely dawn the harbinger of a fair and prosperous day had arisen over the beautiful little village of cumming which is surrounded by the most romantic scenery in the cherokee country brightening clouds seemed to rise from the mist of the fair chattahoochee to spread their beauty over the thick forest to guide the hero whose bosom beats with aspirations to conquer the enemy that would tarnish his name and to win back the admiration of his long-tried friend he endeavored to make his way through sawney's mountain where many meet to catch the gales that are continually blowing for the refreshment of the stranger and the traveller surrounded as he was by hills on every side naked rocks dared the efforts of his energies soon the sky became overcast the sun buried itself in the clouds and the fair day gave place to gloomy twilight which lay heavily on the indian plains he remembered an old indian castle that once stood at the foot of the mountain he thought if he could make his way to this he would rest contented for a short time the mountain air breathed fragrance a rosy tinge rested on the glassy waters that murmured at its base his resolution soon brought him to the remains of the red man's hut he surveyed with wonder and astonishment the decayed building which time had buried in the dust and thought to himself his happiness was not yet complete beside the shore of the brook sat a young man about eighteen or twenty who seemed to be reading some favorite book and who had a remarkably noble countenance eyes which betrayed more than a common mind this of course made the youth a welcome guest and gained him friends in whatever condition of life he might be placed the traveller observed that he was a well-built figure which showed strength and grace in every movement he accordingly addressed him in quite a gentlemanly manner and inquired of him the way to the village after he had received the desired information and was about taking his leave the youth said are you not major elfonzo the great musician the champion of a noble cause the modern achilles who gained so many victories in the florida war i bear that name said the major and those titles trusting at the same time that the ministers of grace will carry me triumphantly through all my laudable undertakings and if continued the major you sir are the patronizer of noble deeds i should like to make you my confidant and learn your address the youth looked somewhat amazed bowed low mused for a moment and began my name is roswell i have been recently admitted to the bar and can only give a faint outline of my future success in that honorable profession but i trust sir like the eagle i shall look down from lofty rocks upon the dwellings of man and shall ever be ready to give you any assistance in my official capacity and whatever this muscular arm of mine can do whenever it shall be called from its buried greatness the major grasped him by the hand and exclaimed 
oh thou exalted spirit of inspiration thou flame of burning prosperity may the heaven-directed blaze be the glare of thy soul and battle down every rampart that seems to impede your progress the road which led to the town presented many attractions elfonzo had bid farewell to the youth of deep feeling and was now wending his way to the dreaming spot of his fondness the south winds whistled through the woods as the waters dashed against the banks as rapid fire in the pent furnace roars this brought him to remember while alone that he quietly left behind the hospitality of a father's house and gladly entered the world with higher hopes than are often realized but as he journeyed onward he was mindful of the advice of his father who had often looked sadly on the ground when tears of cruelly deceived hope moistened his eye elfonzo had been somewhat of a dutiful son yet fond of the amusements of life had been in distant lands had enjoyed the pleasure of the world and had frequently returned to the scenes of his boyhood almost destitute of many of the comforts of life in this condition he would frequently say to his father have i offended you that you look upon me as a stranger and frown upon me with stinging looks will you not favor me with the sound of your voice if i have trampled upon your veneration or have spread a humid veil of darkness around your expectations send me back into the world where no heart beats for me where the foot of man has never yet trod but give me at least one kind word allow me to come into the presence sometimes of thy winter-worn locks forbid it heaven that i should be angry with thee answered the father my son and yet i send thee back to the children of the world to the cold charity of the combat and to a land of victory i read another destiny in thy countenance i learn thy inclinations from the flame that has already kindled in my soul a stranger sensation it will seek thee my dear alfonso it will find thee thou canst not escape that lighted torch which shall blot out from the remembrance of men a long train of prophecies which they have foretold against thee i once thought not so once i was blind but now the path of life is plain before me and my sight is clear yet alfonso return to thy worldly occupation take again in thy hand that cord of sweet sounds struggle with the civilized world and with your own heart fly swiftly to the enchanted ground let the night owl send forth its screams from the stubborn oak let the sea sport upon the beach and the stars sing together but learn of these alfonso thy doom and thy hiding-place our most innocent as well as our most lawful desires must often be denied us that we may learn to sacrifice them to a higher will remembering such admonitions with gratitude elfonzo was immediately urged by the recollection of his father's family to keep moving his steps became quicker and quicker he hastened through the piney woods dark as the forest was and with joy he very soon reached the little village or repose in whose bosom rested the boldest chivalry his close attention to every important object his modest questions about whatever was new to him his reverence for wise old age and his ardent desire to learn many of the fine arts soon brought him into respectable notice one mild winter day as he walked along the streets toward the academy which stood upon a small eminence surrounded by native growth some venerable in its appearance others young and prosperous all seemed inviting and seemed to be the very place for learning as well as for genius to spend its research beneath its spreading shades he entered its classic walls in the usual mode of southern manners the principal of the institution begged him to be seated and listen to the recitations that were going on he accordingly obeyed the request and seemed to be much pleased after the school was dismissed and the young hearts regained their freedom with the songs of the evening laughing at the anticipated pleasures of a happy home while others tittered at the actions of the past day he addressed the teacher in a tone that indicated a resolution with an undaunted mind he said he had determined to become a student if he could meet with his approbation 
sir said he i have spent much time in the world i have traveled among the uncivilized inhabitants of america i have met with friends and combated with foes but none of these gratify my ambition or decide what is to be my destiny i see the learned would have an influence with the voice of the people themselves the despoilers of the remotest kingdoms of the earth refer their differences to this class of persons this the illiterate and inexperienced little dream of and now if you will receive me as i am with these deficiencies with all my misguided opinions i will give you my honor sir that i will never disgrace the institution or those who have placed you in this honorable station the instructor who had met with many disappointments knew how to feel for a stranger who had been thus turned upon the charities of an unfeeling community he looked at him earnestly and said be of good cheer look forward sir to the high destination you may attain remember the more elevated the mark at which you aim the more sure the more glorious the more magnificent the prize from wonder to wonder his encouragement led the impatient listener a strange nature bloomed before him giant streams promised him success gardens of hidden treasures opened to his view all this so vividly described seemed to gain a new witchery from his glowing fancy in eighteen forty two he entered the class and made rapid progress in the english and latin departments indeed he continued advancing with such rapidity that he was like to become the first in his class and made such unexpected progress and was so studious that he had almost forgotten the pictured saint of his affections the fresh wreaths of the pine and cypress had waited anxiously to drop once more the dews of heaven upon the heads of those who had so often poured forth the tender emotions of their souls under its boughs he was aware of the pleasure that he had seen there so one evening as he was returning from his reading he concluded he would pay a visit to this enchanting spot little did he think of witnessing a shadow of his former happiness though no doubt he wished it might be so he continued sauntering by the roadside meditating on the past the nearer he approached the spot the more anxious he became at the moment a tall female figure flitted across his path with a bunch of roses in her hand her countenance showed uncommon vivacity with a resolute spirit her ivory teeth already appeared as she smiled beautifully promenading while her ringlets of hair dangled unconsciously around her snowy neck nothing was wanting to complete her beauty the tinge of the rose was in full bloom upon her cheek the charms of sensibility and tenderness were always her associates in ambulinia's bosom dwelt a noble soul one that never faded one that never was conquered her heart yielded to no feeling but the love of alfonso on whom she gazed with intense delight and to whom she felt herself more closely bound because he sought the hand of no other alfonso was roused from his apparent reverie his books no longer were his inseparable companions his thoughts arrayed themselves to encourage him to the field of victory he endeavored to speak to his supposed ambulinia but his speech appeared not in words no his effort was a stream of fire that kindled his soul into a flame of admiration and carried his senses away captive ambulinia had disappeared to make him more mindful of his duty as she walked speedily away through the piney woods she calmly echoed o oh, alfonso thou wilt now look from thy sunbeams thou shalt now walk in a new path perhaps thy way leads through darkness but fear not the stars foretell happiness not many days afterward as surrounded by fragrant flowers she sat one evening at twilight to enjoy the cool breeze that whispered notes of melody along the distant groves the little birds perched on every side as if to watch the movements of their new visitor the bells were tolling when alfonso silently stole along by the wild wood flowers holding in his hand his favorite instrument of music his eye continually searching for ambulinia who hardly seemed to perceive him as she played carelessly with the songsters that hopped from branch to branch nothing could be more striking than the difference between the two nature seemed to have given the more tender soul to alfonso 
and the stronger and more courageous to Ambulinia. A deep feeling spoke from the eyes of Alfonso, such a feeling as can only be expressed by those who are blessed as admirers, and by those who are able to return the same with sincerity of heart. He was a few years older than Ambulinia. She had turned a little into her seventeenth. He had almost grown up in the Cherokee country, with the same equal proportions as one of the natives. But little intimacy had existed between them until the year forty-one, because the youth felt that the character of such a lovely girl was too exalted to inspire any other feeling than that of quiet reverence. But as lovers will not always be insulted, at all times and under all circumstances, by the frowns and cold looks of crabbed old age, which should continually reflect dignity upon those around, and treat unfortunate as well as the fortunate with a graceful mien, he continued to use diligence and perseverance. All this lighted a spark in his heart that changed his whole character, and like the unyielding deity that follows the storm to check its rage in the forest, he resolves for the first time to shake off his embarrassment and return where he had before only worshipped. It could not escape Ambulinia's penetrating eye that he sought an interview with her, which she as anxiously avoided, and assumed a more distant calmness than before, seemingly to destroy all hope. After many efforts and struggles with his own person, with timid steps the Major approached the damsel with the same caution as he would have done in a field of battle. "'Lady Ambulinia,' said he, trembling, "'I have long desired a moment like this. I dare not let it escape. I fear the consequences. Yet I hope your indulgence will at least hear my petition. Can you not anticipate what I would say, and what I am about to express? Will not you, like Minerva, who sprung from uh, the brain of Jupiter, release me from thy winding chains, or cure me? Say no more, Alfonso, answered Ambulinia, with a serious look, raising her hand as if she intended to swear eternal hatred against the whole world. Another lady in my place would have perhaps answered your question in bitter coldness. I know not the little arts of my sex. I care but little for the vanity of those who would chide me, and am unwilling as well as shamed to be guilty of anything that would lead you to think all is not gold that glitters. So be not rash in your resolution. It is better to repent now than to do it in a more solemn hour. Yes, I know what you would say. I know you have a costly gift for me, the noblest that man can make. Your heart. You should not offer it to one so unworthy. Heaven, you know, has allowed my father's house to be made a house of solitude, a home of silent obedience, which my parents say is more to be admired than big names and high-sounding titles. Notwithstanding all this, let me speak the emotions of an honest heart. Allow me to say, in the fullness of my hopes, that I anticipate better days. The bird may stretch its wings toward the sun, which it can never reach, and flowers of the field appear to ascend in the same direction, because they cannot do otherwise. But man confides his complaints to the saints in whom he believes, for in their abodes of light they know no more sorrow. From your confession and indicative looks, I must be that person. If so, deceive not yourself. Alfonso replied, Pardon me, my dear madam, for my frankness. I have loved you from my earliest days. Everything grand and beautiful hath borne the image of Ambulinia. While precipices on every hand surrounded me, your guardian angel stood and beckoned me away from the deep abyss. In every trial, in every misfortune, I have met with your helping hand. Yet I never dreamed or dared to cherish thy love till a voice impaired with age encouraged the cause, and declared they who acquired thy favor should win a victory. I saw how Leos worshipped thee. I felt my own unworthiness. I began to know jealousy. A strong guest indeed in my bosom, yet I could see if I gained your admiration, Leos was to be my rival. I was aware that he had the influence of your parents, and the wealth of a deceased relative, which is too often mistaken for permanent and regular tranquillity. 
yet i have determined by your permission to beg an interest in your prayers to ask you to animate my dropping spirits by your smiles and your winning looks for if you but speak i shall be conqueror my enemy shall stagger like olympia shakes and though earth and sea may tremble and the charioteer of the sun may forget his dashing steed yet i am assured that it is only to arm me with divine weapons which will enable me to complete my long-tried intention return to yourself alfonso said ambulinia pleasantly a dream of vision has disturbed your intellect you are above the atmosphere dwelling in the celestial regions nothing is there that urges or hinders nothing that brings discord into our present litigation i entreat you to condescend a little and be a man and forget it all when homer describes the battle of the gods and noble men fighting with giants and dragons they represent under this image our struggles with the delusions of our passions you have exalted me an unhappy girl to the skies you have called me a saint and portrayed in your imagination an angel in human form let her remain such to you let her continue to be as you have supposed and be assured that she will consider a share in your esteem as her highest treasure think not that i would allure you from the path in which your conscience leads you for you know i respect the conscience of others as i would die for my own alfonso if i am worthy of thy love let such conversation never again pass between us go seek a nobler theme we will seek it in the stream of time as the sun set in the tigris as she spake these words she grasped the hand of alfonso saying at the same time peace and prosperity attend you my hero be up and doing closing her remarks with this expression she walked slowly away leaving alfonso astonished and amazed he ventured not to follow or detain her here he stood alone gazing at the stars confounded as he was here he stood the rippling stream rolled on at his feet twilight had already begun to draw her sable mantle over the earth and now and then the fiery smoke would ascend from the little town which lay spread out before him the citizens seemed to be full of life and good humor but poor alfonso saw not a brilliant scene no his future life stood before him stripped of the hopes that once adorned all his sanguine desires alas said he am i now grief's disappointed son at last ambulinia's image rose before his fancy a mixture of ambition and greatness of soul moved upon his young heart and encouraged him to bear all his crosses with the patience of a job notwithstanding he had to encounter with so many obstacles he still endeavored to prosecute his studies and reasonably progressed in his education still he was not content there was something yet to be done before his happiness was complete he would visit his friends and acquaintances they would invite him to social parties insisting that he should partake of the amusements that were going on this he enjoyed tolerably well the ladies and gentlemen were generally well pleased with the major as he delighted all with his violin which seemed to have a thousand chords more symphonious than the muses of apollo and more enchanting than the ghost of the hills he passed some days in the country during that time leos had made many calls upon ambulinia who was generally received with a great deal of courtesy by the family they thought of him to be a young man worthy of attention though he had but little in his soul to attract the attention or even win the affections of her whose graceful manners had almost made him a slave to every bewitching look that fell from her eyes leos made several attempts to tell her of his fair prospects how much he loved her and how much it would add to his bliss if he could but think she would be willing to share these blessings with him but choked by his undertaking he made himself more like an inactive drone than he did like one who bowed at beauty's shrine alfonso again wends his way to the stately walls and new-built village he now determines to see the end of the prophecy which had been foretold to him the clouds burst from his sight he believes if he can but see his ambulinia he can open to her view the bloody altars that have been misrepresented to stigmatize his name he knows that her breast is transfixed with the sword of reason 
and ready at all times to detect the hidden villainy of her enemies. He resolves to see her in her own home, with a consoling theme, "'I can but perish if I go. Let the consequences be what they may,' said he. "'If I die, it shall be contending and struggling for my own rights.' Night had almost overtaken him when he arrived in town. Colonel Elder, a noble-hearted, high-minded, and independent man, met him at his door, as usual, and seized him by the hand. "'Well, Alfonso,' said the Colonel, "'how does the world use you in your efforts?' "'I have no objection to the world,' said Alfonso. "'But the people are rather singular in some of their opinions.' "'Aye, well,' said the Colonel, you must remember that creation is made up of many mysteries. Just take things by the right handle. Be always sure you know which is the smooth side before you attempt your polish. Be reconciled to your fate, be it what it may, and never find fault with your condition unless your complaining will benefit it. Perseverance is a principle that should be commendable in those who have judgment to govern it. I should never have been so successful in my hunting excursions had I waited till the deer, by some magic dream, had been drawn to the muzzle of the gun before I made an attempt to fire at the game that dared my boldness in the wild forest. The great mystery in hunting seems to be a good marksman, a resolute mind, a fixed determination, and my word for it, you will never return home without sounding your horn with the breath of a new victory." And so, with every other undertaking, be confident that your ammunition is of the right kind. Always pull your trigger with a steady hand, and so soon as you perceive a calm, touch her off, and the spoils are yours. This filled him with redoubled vigor, and he set out with a stronger anxiety than ever to the home of Ambulinia. A few short steps soon brought him to the door, half out of breath. He rapped gently. Ambulinia, who sat in the parlor alone, suspecting Alfonso was near, ventured to the door, opened it, and beheld the hero, who stood in an humble attitude, bowed gracefully, and as they caught each other's looks the light of peace beamed from the eyes of Ambulinia. Alfonso caught the expression. A halloo of smothered shouts ran through every vein, and for the first time he dared to impress a kiss upon her cheek. The scene was overwhelming. Had the temptation been less animating, he would not have ventured to have acted so contrary to the desired wish of his Ambulinia. But who could have withstood the irresistible temptation? What society condemns the practice but a cold, heartless, uncivilized people that know nothing of the warm attachments of refined society? Here the dead was raised to his long-cherished hopes, and the lost was found. Here all doubt and danger were buried in the vortex of oblivion. Sectional differences no longer disunited their opinions. Like the free bird from the cage, sportive claps its rustling wings, wheels about to heaven in a joyful strain, and raises its notes to the upper sky. Ambulinia insisted upon Alfonso to be seated, and give her a history of his unnecessary absence, assuring him the family had retired, consequently they would ever remain ignorant of his visit. Advancing toward him, she gave a bright display of her rosy neck, and from her head the ambrosial locks breathed divine fragrance. Her robe hung waving to his view, while she stood like a goddess confessed before him. "'It does seem to me, my dear sir,' said Ambulinia, "'that you have been gone an age. Oh, the restless hours I have spent since I last saw you in yon beautiful grove!' There is where I trifled with your feelings for the express purpose of trying your attachment for me. I now find you are devoted, but, ah, I trust you lived not unguarded by the powers of heaven. Though oft did I refuse to join my hand with thine, and as oft did I cruelly mock thy entreaties with borrowed shapes, yes, I feared to answer thee by terms, in words sincere and undissembled. Oh, could I pursue— and you have leisure to hear the annals of my woes, the evening star would shut heaven's gates upon the impending day before my tale would be finished, and this night would find me soliciting your forgiveness. Dismiss thy fears and thy doubts, replied Alfonso. Look, oh, look, that angelic look of thine, bathe not thy visage in tears, 
banish those floods that are gathering let my confession and my presence bring thee some relief then indeed i will be cheerful said ambulinia and i think if we will go to the exhibition this evening we certainly will see something worthy of our attention one of the most tragical scenes is to be acted that has ever been witnessed and one that every jealous-hearted person should learn a lesson from it cannot fail to have a good effect as it will be performed by those who are young and vigorous and learned as well as enticing you are aware major alfonso who are to appear on the stage and what the characters are to represent i am acquainted with the circumstances replied alfonso and as i am to be one of the musicians upon that interesting occasion i should be much gratified if you would favor me with your company during the hours of the exercises what strange notions are in your mind inquired ambulinia now i know you have something in view and i desire you to tell me why it is that you are so anxious that i should continue with you while the exercises are going on though if you think i can add to your happiness and predilections i have no particular objection to acquiesce in your request oh i think i foresee now what you anticipate and will you have the goodness to tell me what you think it will be inquired alfonso by all means answered ambulinia a rival sir you would fancy in your own mind but let me say to you fear not fear not i will be one of the last persons to disgrace my sex by thus encouraging every one who may feel disposed to visit me who may honor me with their graceful bows and their choicest compliments it is true that young men too often mistake civil politeness for the finer emotions of the heart which is tantamount to courtship but ah how often are they deceived when they come to test the weight of sunbeams with those on whose strength hangs the future happiness of an untried life the people were now rushing to the academy with impatient anxiety the band of music was closely followed by the students then the parents and guardians nothing interrupted the glow of spirits which ran through every bosom tinged with the songs of a virgil and the tide of a homer alfonso and ambulinia soon repaired to the scene and fortunately for them both the house was so crowded that they took their seats together in the music department which was not in view of the auditory this fortuitous circumstance added more to the bliss of the major than a thousand such exhibitions would have done he forgot that he was man music had lost its charm for him whenever he attempted to carry his part the string of the instrument would break the bow became stubborn and refused to obey the loud calls of the audience here he said was the paradise of his home the long sought-for opportunity he felt as though he could send a million supplications to the throne of heaven for such an exalted privilege poor leos who was somewhere in the crowd looking as attentively as if he was searching for a needle in a haystack here he stood wondering to himself why ambulinia was not there where can she be oh if she was only here how i could relish the scene alfonso is certainly not in town but what if he is i have got the wealth if i have not the dignity and i am sure that the squire and his lady have always been particular friends of mine and i think with this assurance i shall be able to get upon the blind side of the rest of the family and make the heaven-born ambulinia the mistress of all i possess then again he would drop his head as if attempting to solve the most difficult problem in euclid while he was thus conjecturing in his own mind a very interesting part of the exhibition was going on which called the attention of all present the curtains of the stage waved continually by the repelled forces that were given to them which caused leos to behold ambulinia leaning upon the chair of alfonso her lofty beauty seen by the glimmering of the chandelier filled his heart with rapture he knew not how to contain himself to go where they were would expose him to ridicule to continue where he was with such an object before him without being allowed an explanation in that trying hour would be to the great injury of his mental as well as of his physical powers and in the name of high heaven what must he do finally he resolved to contain himself as well as he conveniently could until the scene was over and then he would plant himself at the door to arrest ambulinia from the hands of the insolent alfonso and thus make for himself a more prosperous field of immortality than ever was decreed by omnipotence 
or ever pencil drew or artist imagined. Accordingly he made himself sentinel, immediately after the performance of the evening, retained his position apparently in defiance of all the world. He waited, he gazed at every lady, his whole frame trembled. Here he stood, until everything like human shape had disappeared from the institution, and he had done nothing. He had failed to accomplish that which he so eagerly sought for. Poor unfortunate creature! He had not the eyes of an Argus, or he might have seen his Juno and Alfonso, assisted by his friend Sigma, make their escape from the window, and, with the rapidity of a racehorse, hurry through the blast of the storm to the residence of her father, without being recognized. He did not tarry long, but assured Ambulinia the endless chain of their existence was more closely connected than ever, since he had seen the virtuous, innocent, imploring, and the constant Amelia murdered by the jealous-hearted Farcillo, the accursed of the land. The following is the tragical scene, which is only introduced to show the subject matter that enabled Alfonso to come to such a determinate resolution that nothing of the kind should ever dispossess him of his true character, should he be so fortunate as to succeed in his present undertaking. Amelia was the wife of Farcillo, and a virtuous woman. Gracia, a young lady, was her particular friend and confidant. Farcillo grew jealous of Amelia, murders her, finds out that he was deceived, and stabs himself. Amelia appears alone, talking to herself. A. Hail, ye solitary ruins of antiquity, ye sacred tombs and silent walks! It is your aid I invoke, it is to you my soul, wrapped in deep mediation, pours forth its prayer. Here I wander upon the stage of mortality, since the world hath turned against me. Those whom I believe to be my friends, alas, are now my enemies, planting thorns in all my paths, poisoning all my pleasures, and turning the past to pain. What a lingering catalogue of sighs and tears lies just before me, crowding my aching bosom with a fleeting dream of humanity, which must shortly terminate. And to what purpose will all this bustle of life, these agitations and emotions of the heart, have conduced? if it leave behind it nothing of utility, if it leave no traces of improvement. Can it be that I am deceived in my conclusions? No, I see that I have nothing to hope for, but everything for fear, which tends to drive me from the walks of time. Oh, in this dead night, if loud winds arise, to lash the surge and bluster in the skies, may the west its furious rage display, toss me with storms in the watery way. Enter Gracia. G. Oh, Amelia, is it you, the object of grief, the daughter of opulence, of wisdom and philosophy, that thus complaineth? it cannot be you are the child of misfortune speaking of the monuments of former ages which were allotted not for the reflection of the distressed but for the fearless and bold a not the child of poverty gracia or the heir of glory and peace but of fate remember i have wealth more than wit can number i have had power more than kings could encompass yet the world seems a desert all nature appears an afflictive spectacle of warring passions. This blind fatality that capriciously sports with the rules and lives of mortals tells me that the mountains will never again send forth the water of their springs to my thirst. Oh, that I might be freed and set at liberty from wretchedness! But I fear, I fear this will never be. G. Why, Amelia, this untimely grief! What has caused the sorrows that bespeak better and happier days to thus lavish out such heaps of misery? You are aware that your instructive lessons embellish the mind with holy truths by wedding its attention to none but great and noble affections. A. This, of course, is some consolation. I will ever love my own species with feelings of a fond recollection, and while I am studying to advance the universal philanthropy, and the spotless name of my own sex, I will try to build my own upon the pleasing belief 
that I have accelerated the advancement of one who whispers of departed confidence. And I, like some poor peasant fated to reside remote from friends in a forest wide, oh, see what woman's woes and human wants require, since that great day hath spread the seed of sinful fire. G. Look up, thou poor disconsolate! You speak of quitting earthly enjoyments. Unfold thy bosom to a friend, who would be willing to sacrifice every enjoyment for the restoration of the dignity and gentleness of mind which used to grace your walks, and which is so natural to yourself. Not only that, but your paths were strewed with flowers of every hue and of every order. With verdant green the mountains glow, for thee, for thee, the lilies grow far stretched beneath the tented hills a fairer flower the valley fills a oh would to heaven i could give you a short narrative of my former prospects for happiness since you have acknowledged to be an unchangeable confidant the richest of all other blessings o oh, ye names for ever glorious ye celebrated scenes ye renowned spot of my hymeneal moments how replete is your chart with sublime reflections how many profound vows decorated with immaculate deeds are written upon the surface of that precious spot of earth where i yielded up my life of celibacy bad youth with all its beauties a final adieu took a last farewell of the laurels that had accompanied me up the hill of my juvenile career it was then i began to descend toward the valley of disappointment and sorrow it was then i cast my little bark upon a mysterious ocean of wedlock with him who then smiled and caressed me but alas now frowns with bitterness and has grown jealous and cold toward me because the ring he gave me is misplaced or lost oh bear me ye flowers of memory softly through the eventful history of past times and ye places that have witnessed the progression of man in the circle of so many societies and oh aid my recollection while i endeavor to trace the vicissitudes of a life devoted in endeavoring to comfort him that i claim as the object of my wishes ah ye mysterious men of all the world how few act just to heaven and to your promise true but he who guides the stars with a watchful eye the deeds of men lay open without disguise oh this alone will avenge the wrongs i bear for all the oppressed are his peculiar care f makes a slight noise a who is there Farcillo? G then i must be gone heaven protect you o amelia farewell be of good cheer may you stand like olympus towers against earth and all jealous powers may you with loud shouts ascend on high swift as an eagle in the upper sky a why so cold and distant to-night Facillo? come let us each other greet and forget all the past and give security for the future f security talk to me about giving security for the future what an insulting requisition have you said your prayers to-night madame amelia a Facillo, we sometimes forget our duty particularly when we expect to be caressed by others f if you bethink yourself of any crime or of any fault that is yet concealed from the courts of heaven and the thrones of grace I bid you ask and solicit forgiveness for it now. A. Oh, be kind, Farcillo, don't treat me so. What do you mean by all this? F. Be kind, you say. You, madam, have forgot that kindness you owe to me, and bestowed it upon another. You shall suffer for your conduct when you make your peace with your God. I would not slay thy unprotected spirit. I call to heaven to be my guard and my watch. I would not kill thy soul, in which all once seemed just, right, and perfect, but I must be brief, woman. A. What talk you of killing? Oh, Farcillo, Farcillo, what is the matter? F. Ay, I do, without doubt. Mark what I say, Amelia. A. Then, O oh God, O oh heaven and angels, be propitious, and have mercy upon me. F. Amen to that woman, with all my heart and with all my soul. 
End of The Curious Book, Part 1「This is section 18 of the thirty thousand dollar bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Curious Book, Part 2, by Mark Twain. A. Facia, listen to me one moment. I hope you will not kill me. F. Kill you? Aye, that I will. Attest it. Ye fair host of light, record it, ye dark imps of hell. A. Oh, I fear you. You are fatal when darkness covers your brow. Yet I know not why I should fear, since I never wronged you in all my life. I stand, sir, guiltless before you. F. You pretend to say you are guiltless. Think of thy sins, Amelia. Think, oh, think, hidden woman. A. Wherein have I not been true to you, that death is unkind, cruel, and unnatural, that kills for loving? F. Peace, and be still while I unfold to thee. A. I will, Farcillo, and while I am thus silent, tell me the cause of such cruel coldness in an hour like this. F. That ring! Oh, that ring I so loved and gave thee as the ring of my heart, the allegiance you took to be faithful when it was presented, the kisses and smiles with which you honored it. You became tired of the donor, despised it as a plague, and finally gave it to Malos, the hidden, the vile traitor. A. No, upon my word and honor I never did. I appealed to the Most High to bear me out in this matter. Send for Malos, and ask him. F. Send for Malos. Aye, Malos you wish to see. I thought so. I knew you could not keep his name concealed. Amelia, sweet Amelia, take heed, take heed of perjury. You are on the stage of death to suffer for your sins. A. What? Not to die, I hope, my Farcillo, my ever-beloved. F. Yes, madam, to die a traitor's death. Shortly your spirit shall take its exit. Therefore confess freely thy sins, for to deny tends only to make me groan under the bitter cup thou hast made for me. Thou art to die with the name of traitor on thy brow. A. Then, O oh Lord, have mercy upon me. Give me courage. Give me grace and fortitude to stand this hour of trial. F. Amen, I say, with all my heart. A. And, O oh, Farcillo, will you have mercy too? I never intentionally offended you in all my life, never loved Malus, never gave him cause to think so, as the high court of justice will acquit me before its tribunal. F. O oh, false perjured woman, thou dost chill my blood, and makest me a demon like thyself. I saw the ring. A. He found it, then, or got it clandestinely. Send for him, and let him confess the truth. Let his confession be sifted. F. And you still wish to see him. I tell you, madam, he hath already confessed, and thou knowest the darkness of thy heart. A. What, my deceived Farcillo, that I gave him the ring in which all my affections were concentrated? Oh, surely not. F. I, he did. Ask thy conscience, and it will speak with a voice of thunder to thy soul. A. He will not say so, he dare not, he cannot. F. No, he will not say so now, because his mouth, I trust, is hushed in death, and his body stretched to the four winds of heaven to be torn to pieces by carnivorous birds. A. What, is he dead and gone to the world of spirits with that declaration in his mouth? O oh, unhappy man, O oh, insuperable hour! F. Yes and had all his sighs and looks and tears been lives, my great revenge could have slain them all without the least condemnation. A. Alas, he is ushered into eternity without testing the matter for which I am abused and sentenced and condemned to die. F. Cursed, infernal woman! Weepest thou for him to my face? He that hath robbed me of my peace, my energy, the whole love of my life, 
could I call the fabled Hydra, I would have him live and perish, survive and die until the sun itself would grow dim with age. I would make him have the thirst of a Tantalus, and roll the wheel of an Ixion, until the stars of heaven should quit their brilliant stations. A. O oh, invincible God, save me! O oh, unsupportable moment! O oh, heavy hour! Banish me, for Sio, send me where no eye can ever see me, where no sound shall ever grate my ear. But, oh, slay me not, for Sio, vent thy rage and thy spite upon this emaciated frame of mine, only spare my life. F. Your petitions avail nothing, cruel Amelia. A. Oh, for Sio, perpetrate the dark deed to-morrow, let me live till then, for my past kindness to you, and it may be some kind angel will show to you that I am not only the object of innocence, but one who never loved another but your noble self. F. Amelia, the decree has gone forth, it is to be done, and that quickly. Thou art to die, madam. A. But half an hour allow me to see my father and my only child, to tell her the treachery and vanity of this world. F. There is no alternative. There is no pause. My daughter shall not see its deceptive mother die. Your father shall not know that his daughter fell disgraced, despised by all but her enchanting malos. A. Oh, Farcillo, put up thy threatening dagger into its scabbard. Let it rest and be still just while I say one prayer for thee and for my child. F. It is too late. Thy doom is fixed. Thou hast not confessed to heaven or to me, my child's protector. Thou art to die. Ye powers of earth and heaven, protect and defend me in this alone. Stabs her while imploring for mercy. A. O oh, Farcillo, Farcillo, a guiltless death I die. F. Die 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 gracia enters running falls on her knees weeping and kisses amelia g oh farcillo farcillo oh farcillo f i am here the genius of the age and the avenger of my wrongs g oh lady speak once more sweet amelia oh speak again gone gone yes forever gone farcillo Oh, cold-hearted Farcillo, some evil fiend hath urged you to do this, Farcillo. F. Say not so again, or you shall receive the same fate. I did the glorious deed, madam. Beware, then, how you talk. G. I fear not your implements of war. I will let you know you have not the power to do me harm. If you have a heart of triple brass, it shall be reached and melted, and thy blood shall chill thy veins, and grow stiff in thy arteries. Here is the ring of thy virtuous and innocent murdered Amelia. I obtained it from Malos, who yet lives, in hopes that he will survive the wound given him, and says he got it clandestinely, declares Amelia to be the princess of truth and virtue, invulnerable to anything like forgetting her first devotion to thee. The world has heard of your conduct and your jealousy, and with one universal voice declares her to be the best of all in piety, that she is the star of this great universe, and a more virtuous woman never lived since the wheels of time began. Oh, had you waited till to-morrow, or until I had returned, some kind window would have been opened to her relief. But, alas, she is gone, yes, forever gone, to try the realities of an unknown world." Farcillo leaning over the body of Amelia. F. Malos, not dead, and here is my ring. O oh, Amelia, falsely, falsely murdered. O oh, bloody deed! O oh, wretch that I am! O oh, angels, forgive me! O oh, God, withhold thy vengeance! O oh, Amelia, if heaven would make a thousand worlds like this, set with diamonds, and all of one perfect chrysolite, I would not have done this for them all. I would not have frowned and cursed as I did. Oh, she was heavenly true, nursed in the very lap of bright angels. Cursed slave that I am, jealousy, oh, thou infernal demon, lost, lost to every sense of honor. Oh, Amelia, heaven-born Amelia, dead, dead, oh, 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 then let me die with thee. Farewell, farewell. 
ye world that deceived me stabs himself soon after the excitement of this tragical scene was over and the enlisted feeling for amelia had grown more buoyant with alfonso and ambulinia he determined to visit his retired home and make the necessary improvements to enjoy a better day consequently he conveyed the following lines to ambulinia go tell the world that hope is glowing go bid the rocks their silence break go tell the stars that love is glowing then bid the hero his lover take in the region where scarcely the foot of man hath ever trod where the woodman hath not found his way lies a blooming grove seen only by the sun when he mounts his lofty throne visited only by the light of the stars to whom are entrusted the guardianship of earth before the sun sinks to rest in his rosy bed high cliffs of rocks surround the romantic place and in the small cavity of the rocky wall grows the daffodil clear and pure and as the wind blows along the enchanting little mountain which surrounds the lonely spot it nourishes the flowers with the dewdrops of heaven here is the seat of alfonso darkness claims but little victory over this dominion and in vain does she spread out her gloomy wings here the waters flow perpetually and the trees lash their tops together to bid the welcome visitor a happy muse alfonso during his short stay in the country had fully persuaded himself that it was his duty to bring this solemn matter to an issue a duty that he individually owed as a gentleman to the parents of ambulinia a duty in itself involving not only his own happiness and his own standing in society but one that called aloud the act of the parties to make it perfect and complete how he should communicate his intentions to get a favorable reply he was at a loss to know he knew not whether to address esquire valier in prose or in poetry in a jocular or an argumentative manner or whether he should use moral suasion legal injunction or seizure and take by reprisal if it was to do the latter he would have no difficulty in deciding in his own mind but his gentlemanly honor was at stake so he concluded to address the following letter to the father and mother of ambulinia as his address in person he knew would only aggravate the old gentleman and perhaps his lady coming georgia january twenty second eighteen forty four mr and mrs valeer again i resume the pleasing task of addressing you and once more beg an immediate answer to my many salutations from every circumstance that has taken place i feel in duty bound to comply with my obligations to forfeit my word would be more than i dare do to break my pledge and my vows that have been witnessed sealed and delivered in the presence of an unseen deity would be disgraceful on my part as well as ruinous to ambulinia i wish no longer to be kept in suspense about this matter i wish to act gentlemanly in every particular it is true the promises i have made are unknown to any but ambulinia and i think it unnecessary to here enumerate them as they who promise the most generally perform the least can you for a moment doubt my sincerity or my character my only wish is sir that you may calmly and dispassionately look at the situation of the case and if your better judgment should dictate otherwise my obligations may induce me to pluck the flower that you so diametrically opposed we have sworn by the saints by the gods of battle and by that faith whereby just men are made perfect to be united i hope my dear sir you will find it convenient as well as agreeable to give me a favorable answer with the signature of mrs valeer as well as yourself with very great esteem your humble servant j i alfonso the moon and stars had grown pale when ambulinia had retired to rest a crowd of unpleasant thoughts passed through her bosom solitude dwelt in her chamber no sound from the neighboring world penetrated its stillness it appeared a temple of silence of repose and of mystery at that moment she heard a still voice calling her father in an instant like the flash of lightning a thought ran through her mind that it must be the bearer of alfonso's communication it is not a dream she said 
no i cannot read dreams oh i would to heaven i was near that glowing eloquence that poetical language it charms the mind in an inexpressible manner and warms the coldest heart while consoling herself with this strain her father rushed into her room almost frantic with rage exclaiming oh ambulinia ambulinia undutiful ungrateful daughter what does this mean why does this letter bear such heart-rending intelligence will you quit a father's house with this debased wretch without a place to lay his distracted head going up and down the country with every novel object that may chance to wander through this region he is a pretty man to make love known to his superiors and you ambulinia have done but little credit to yourself by honoring his visits oh wretchedness can it be that my hopes of happiness are forever blasted will you not listen to a father's entreaties and pay some regard to a mother's tears i know and i do pray that god will give me fortitude to bear with this sea of troubles and rescue my daughter my ambulinia as a brand from the eternal burning forgive me father oh forgive thy child replied ambulinia my heart is ready to break when i see you in this grieved state of agitation oh think not so meanly of me as that i mourn for my own danger father i am only woman mother i am only the templement of thy youthful years but will suffer courageously whatever punishment you think proper to inflict upon me if you will but allow me to comply with my most sacred promises if you will but give me my personal right and my personal liberty o oh, father if your generosity will but give me these i ask nothing more when alfonso offered me his heart i gave him my hand never to forsake him and now may the mighty god banish me before i leave him in adversity what a heart must i have to rejoice in prosperity with him whose offers i have accepted and then when poverty comes haggard as it may be for me to trifle with the oracles of heaven and change with every fluctuation that may interrupt our happiness like the politician who runs the political gauntlet for office one day and the next because the horizon is darkened a little he is seen running for his life for fear he might perish in its ruins where is the philosophy where is the consistency where is the charity in conduct like this be happy then my beloved father and forget me let the sorrow of parting break down the wall of separation and make us equal in our feeling let me now say how ardently i love you let me kiss that age-worn cheek and should my tears bedew thy face i will wipe them away oh i never can forget you no never never weep not said the father ambulinia i will forbid alfonso my house and desire that you may keep retired a few days i will let him know that my friendship for my family is not linked together by cankered chains and if he ever enters upon my premises again i will send him to his long home oh father let me entreat you to be calm upon this occasion and though alfonso may be the sport of the clouds and winds yet i feel assured that no fate will send him to the silent tomb until the god of the universe calls him hence with a triumphant voice here the father turned away exclaiming i will answer his letter in a very few words and you madam will have the goodness to stay at home with your mother and remember i am determined to protect you from the consuming fire that looks so fair to your view coming january twenty two eighteen forty four sir in regard to your request i am as i ever have been utterly opposed to your marrying into my family and if you have any regard for yourself or any gentlemanly feeling i hope you will mention it to me no more but seek some other one who is not so far superior to you in standing w w valier when alfonso read the above letter he became so much depressed in spirits that many of his friends thought it advisable to use other means to bring about the happy union strange said he that the contents of this diminutive letter should cause me to have such depressed feelings but there is a nobler theme than this i know not why my military title is not as great as that of squire valier 
for my life i cannot see that my ancestors are inferior to those who are so bitterly opposed to my marriage with ambulinia i know i have seen huge mountains before me yet when i think that i know gentlemen will insult me upon this delicate matter should i become angry at fools and babblers who pride themselves in their impudence and ignorance no my equals i know not where to find them my inferiors i think it beneath me and my superiors i think it presumption therefore if this youthful heart is protected by any of these divine rights i never will betray my trust he was aware that ambulinia had a confidence that was indeed as firm and as resolute as she was beautiful and interesting he hastened to the cottage of louisa who received him in her usual mode of pleasantness and informed him that ambulinia had just that moment left is it possible said alfonso oh murdered hours why did she not remain and be the guardian of my secrets but hasten and tell me how she has stood this trying scene and what are her future determinations you know said louisa major alfonso that you have ambulinia's first love which is of no small consequence she came here about twilight and shed many precious tears in consequence of her own fate with yours we walked silently in yon little valley you see where we spent a momentary repose she seemed to be quite as determined as ever and before we left that beautiful spot she offered up a prayer to heaven for thee i will see her then replied alfonso though legions of enemies may oppose she is mine by foreordination she is mine by prophecy she is mine by her own free will and i will rescue her from the hands of her oppressors will you not miss louisa assist me in my capture i will certainly by the aid of divine providence answered louisa endeavor to break those slavish chains that bind the richest of prizes though allow me major to entreat you to use no harsh means on this important occasion take a decided stand and write freely to ambulinia upon this subject and i will see that no intervening cause hinders its passage to her god alone will save a mourning people now is the day and now is the hour to obey a command of such valuable worth the major felt himself grow stronger after this short interview with louisa he felt as if he could whip his weight in wildcats he knew he was master of his own feelings and could now write a letter that would bring this litigation to an issue coming january twenty fourth eighteen forty four dear ambulinia we have now reached the most trying moment of our lives we are pledged not to forsake our trust we have waited for a favorable hour to come thinking your friends would settle the matter agreeably among themselves and finally be reconciled to our marriage but as i have waited in vain and looked in vain i have determined in my own mind to make a proposition to you though you may think it not in accord with your station or compatible with your rank yet sub hoc signo vinces you know i cannot resume my visits in consequence of the utter hostility that your father has to me therefore the consummation of our union will have to be sought for in a more sublime sphere at the residence of a respectable friend of this village you cannot have any scruples upon this mode of proceeding if you will but remember it emanates from one who loves you better than his own life who is more than anxious to bid you welcome to a new and happy home your warmest associates say come the talented the learned the wise and the experienced say come all these with their friends say come viewing these with many other inducements i flatter myself that you will come to the embraces of your alfonso for now is the time of your acceptance of the day of your liberation you cannot be ignorant ambulinia that thou art the desire of my heart its thoughts are too noble and too pure to conceal themselves from you i shall wait for your answer to this impatiently expecting that you will set the time to make your departure and to be in readiness at a moment's warning to share the joys of a more preferable life this will be handed to you by louisa who will take a pleasure in communicating anything to you that may relieve your dejected spirits and will assure you that i now stand ready willing and waiting to make good my vows i am dear ambulinia yours truly and forever j i alfonso 
Louisa made it convenient to visit Mr. Valier's, though they did not suspect her in the least the bearer of love epistles. Consequently she was invited in the room to console Ambulinia, where they were left alone. Ambulinia was seated by a small table, her head resting on her hand. Her brilliant eyes were bathed in tears. Louisa handed her the letter of Alfonso, when another spirit animated her features, the spirit of renewed confidence that never fails to strengthen the female character in an hour of grief and sorrow like this, and as she pronounced the last accent of his name she exclaimed, "'And does he love me yet? I never will forget your generosity, Louisa. Oh, unhappy and yet blessed Louisa! May you never feel what I have felt! May you never know the pangs of love! Had I never loved, I never would have been unhappy. But I turn to him who can save, and if his wisdom does not will my expected union, I know he will give me strength to bear my lot. Amuse yourself with this little book, and take it as an apology for my silence," said Ambulinia, while I attempt to answer this volume of consolation. "'Thank you,' said Louisa. You are excusable upon this occasion, but I pray you, Ambulinia, to be expert upon this momentous subject, that there may be nothing mistrustful upon my part." "'I will,' said Ambulinia, and immediately resumed her seat and addressed the following to Alfonso. Coming, Georgia, January 28, 1844. Devoted Alfonso, I hail your letter as a welcome messenger of faith, and can now say truly and firmly that my feelings correspond with yours. Nothing shall be wanting on my part to make my obedience your fidelity. Courage and perseverance will accomplish success. Receive this as my oath, that while I grasp your hand in my own imagination, we stand united before a higher tribunal than any on earth. All the powers of my life, soul and body, I devote to thee. Whatever dangers may threaten me, I fear not to encounter them. Perhaps I have determined upon my own destruction by leaving the house of the best of parents. Be it so. I flee to you. I share your destiny, faithful to the end. The day that I have concluded upon for this task is Sabbath next, when the family with the citizens are generally at church. For heaven's sake, let not that day pass unimproved. Trust not till to-morrow. It is the cheat of life, the future that never comes, the grave of many noble births, the cavern of ruined enterprise, which, like the lightning's flash, is born and dies and perishes ere the voice of him who sees can cry, Behold, behold! You may trust to what I say. No power shall tempt me to betray confidence. Suffer me to add one word more. I will soothe thee in all thy grief beside the gloomy river, and though thy love may yet be brief, mine is fixed for ever. Receive the deepest emotions of my heart for thy constant love, and may the power of inspiration be thy guide, thy portion, and thy all. In great haste, yours faithfully, Ambulinia. I now take my leave of you, sweet girl, said Louisa, sincerely wishing you success on Sabbath next. When Ambulinia's letter was handed to Alfonso, he perused it without doubting its contents. Louisa charged him to make but few confidants, but like most young men who happened to win the heart of a beautiful girl, he was so elated with the idea that he felt as a commanding general on parade, who had confidence in all, consequently gave orders to all. The appointed Sabbath, with a delicious breeze and cloudless sky, made its appearance. The people gathered in crowds to the church, the streets were filled with neighboring citizens, all marching to the house of worship. It is entirely useless for me to attempt to describe the feelings of Alfonso and Ambulinia, who were silently watching the movements of the multitude, apparently counting them as they entered the house of God, looking for the last one to darken the door. The impatience and anxiety with which they waited, and the bliss they anticipated on the eventful day, is altogether indescribable. Those that have been so fortunate as to embark in such a noble enterprise know all its realities and those who have not had this inestimable privilege will have to taste its sweets before they can tell to others its joys, its comforts, 
and its heaven-born worth. Immediately after Ambulinia had assisted the family off to church, she took advantage of that opportunity to make good her promises. She left a home of enjoyment to be wedded to one whose love had been justifiable. A few short steps brought her to the presence of Louisa, who urged her to make good use of her time, and not to delay a moment, but to go with her to her brother's house, where Alfonso would forever make her happy. With lively speed and yet a graceful air, she entered the door and found herself protected by the champion of her confidence. The necessary arrangements were fast making to have the two lovers united. Everything was in readiness except the parson, and as they are generally very sanctimonious on such occasions, the news got to the parents of Ambulinia before the everlasting knot was tied, and they both came running, with uplifted hands and injured feelings, to arrest their daughter from an unguarded and hasty resolution. Alfonso desired to maintain his ground, but Ambulinia thought it best for him to leave, to prepare for a greater contest. He accordingly obeyed, as it would have been a vain endeavor for him to have battled against a man who was armed with deadly weapons, and besides, he could not resist the request of such a pure heart. Ambulinia concealed herself in the upper story of the house, fearing the rebuke of her father. The door was locked, and no chastisement was now expected. Esquire Valier, whose pride was already touched, resolved to preserve the dignity of his family. He entered the house almost exhausted, looking wildly for Ambulinia. "'Amazed and astonished indeed I am,' said he, "'at a people who call themselves civilized, to allow such behavior as this. "'Ambulinia! Ambulinia!' he cried. "'Come to the calls of your first, your best, and your only friend. "'I appeal to you, sir,' turning to the gentleman of the house, "'to know where Ambulinia has gone, or where is she?' "'Do you mean to insult me, sir, in my own house?' inquired the gentleman. "'I will burst,' said Mr. V., "'asunder every door in your dwelling, in search of my daughter, "'if you do not speak quickly and tell me where she is. "'I care nothing about that outcast rubbish of creation, "'that mean, low-lived Alfonso, if I can but obtain Ambulinia. "'Are you not going to open this door?' said he. "'By the Eternal that made heaven and earth, "'I will go about the work instantly, if this is not done.' The confused citizens gathered from all parts of the village to know the cause of this commotion. Some rushed into the house. The door that was locked flew open, and there stood Ambulinia weeping. "'Father, be still,' said she, "'and I will follow thee home.' But the agitated man seized her, and bore her off through the gazing multitude. "'Father,' she exclaimed, "'I humbly beg your pardon. I will be dutiful. I will obey thy commands.' Let the sixteen years I have lived in obedience to thee be my future security. I don't like to be always giving credit when the old score is not paid up, madam," said the father. The mother followed almost in a state of derangement, crying and imploring her to think beforehand, and ask advice from experienced persons, and they would tell her it was a rash undertaking. Oh, said she, Ambulinia, my daughter, did you know what I have suffered? Did you know how many nights I have whiled away in agony, in pain, and in fear? You would pity the sorrows of a heartbroken mother. Well, mother, replied Ambulinia, I know I have been disobedient. I am aware that what I have done might have been done much better, but, oh, what shall I do with my honor? It is so dear to me. I am pledged to Alfonso. His high moral worth is certainly worth some attention. Moreover, my vows, I have no doubt, are recorded in the book of life. And must I give these all up? Must my fair hopes be forever blasted? Forbid it, father! Oh, forbid it, mother! Forbid it, heaven! I have seen so many beautiful skies overclouded, replied the mother, so many blossoms nipped by the frost that I am afraid to trust you to the care of those fair days, which may be interrupted by thundering and tempestuous nights. You no doubt think, as I did, life's devious ways were strewn with sweet-scented flowers, but, ah, how long they have lingered around me and took their flight in the vivid hope that laughs at the drooping victims it has murdered. Alfonso was moved at this sight. 
the people followed on to see what was going to become of ambulinia while he with downcast looks kept at a distance until he saw them enter the abode of the father thrusting her that was the sigh of his soul out of his presence into a solitary apartment when she exclaimed elfonzo elfonzo o oh, elfonzo where art thou with all thy heroes haste o oh, haste come thou to my relief ride on the wings of the wind turn thy force loose like a tempest and roll on thy army like a whirlwind over this mountain of trouble and confusion o oh, friends if any pity me let your last efforts throng upon the green hills and come to the relief of ambulinia who is guilty of nothing but innocent love elfonzo called out with a loud voice my god can i stand this arise up i beseech you and put an end to this tyranny come my brave boys said he are you ready to go forth to your duty they stood around him who said he will call us to arms where are my thunderbolts of war speak ye the first who will meet the foe who will go forward with me in this ocean of grievous temptation if there is one who desires to go let him come and shake hands upon the altar of devotion and swear that he will be a hero yes a hector in a cause like this which calls aloud for a speedy remedy mine be the deed said a young lawyer and mine alone venus alone shall quit her station before i will forsake one jot or title of my promise to you what is death to me what is all this warlike army if it is not to win a victory i love the sleep of the lover and the mighty nor would i give it over till the blood of my enemies should reek with that of my own but god forbid that our fame should soar on the blood of the slumberer mr valeer stands at his door with the frown of a demon upon his brow with his dangerous weapon ready to strike the first man who should enter his door who will arise and go forward through blood and carnage to rescue my ambulinia said elfonzo all exclaimed the multitude and onward they went with their implements of battle others of a more timid nature stood among the distant hills to see the result of the contest elfonzo took the lead of his band night arose in clouds darkness concealed the heavens but the blazing hopes that stimulated them gleamed in every bosom all approached the anxious spot they rushed to the front of the house and with one exclamation demanded ambulinia away be gone and disturb my peace no more said mr valeer you are a set of base insolent and infernal rascals go the, the northern stars points your path through the dim twilight of the night go and vent your spite upon the lonely hills pour forth your love you poor weak-minded wretch upon your idleness and upon your guitar and your fiddle they are fit subjects for your admiration for let me assure you though this sword and iron lever are cankered yet they frown in sleep and let one of you dare to enter my house this night and you shall have the contents and the weight of these instruments never yet did base dishonor blur my name said elfonzo mine is a cause of renown here are my warriors fear and tremble for this night though hell itself should oppose i will endeavor to avenge her whom thou hast banished in solitude the voice of ambulinia shall be heard from that dark dungeon at that moment ambulinia appeared at the window above and with a tremulous voice said live elfonzo oh live to raise my stone of moss why should such language enter your heart why should thy voice rend the air with such agitation i bid thee live once more remembering these tears of mine are shed alone for thee in this dark and gloomy vault and should i perish under this load of trouble join the song of thrilling accents with the raven above my grave and lay this tattered frame beside the banks of the chattahoochee or the stream of sawney's brook sweet will be the song of death to your ambulinia my ghost shall visit you in the smiles of paradise and tell your high fame to the minds of that region which is far more preferable than this lonely cell my heart shall speak for thee till the latest hour 
i know faint and broken are the sounds of sorrow yet our souls alfonso shall hear the peaceful songs together one bright name shall be ours on high if we are not permitted to be united here bear in mind that i still cherish my old sentiments and the poet will mingle the names of alfonso and ambulinia in the tide of other days fly alfonso said the voices of his united band to the wounded heart of your beloved all enemies shall fall beneath thy sword fly through the clefts and the dim spark shall sleep in death alfonso rushes forward and strikes his shield against the door which was barricaded to prevent any intercourse his brave sons throng around him the people pour along the streets both male and female to prevent or witness the melancholy scene to arms to arms cried alfonso here is a victory to be won a prize to be gained that is more to me than the whole world beside it cannot be done to-night said mr valeer i bear the clang of death my strength and armor shall prevail my ambulinia shall rest in this hall until the break of another day and if we fall we fall together if we die we die clinging to our tattered rights and our blood alone shall tell the mournful tale of a murdered daughter and a ruined father sure enough he kept watch all night and was successful in defending his house and family the bright morning gleamed upon the hills night vanished away the major and his associates felt somewhat ashamed that they had not been as fortunate as they expected to have been however they still leaned upon their arms in dispersed groups some were walking the streets others were talking in the major's behalf many of the citizens suspended business as the town presented nothing but consternation a novelty that might end in the destruction of some worthy and respectable citizens mr valeer ventured in the streets though not without being well armed some of his friends congratulated him on the decided stand he had taken and hoped he would settle the matter amicably with alfonso without any serious injury me he replied what me condescend to fellowship with a coward and a low-lived lazy undermining villain no gentlemen this cannot be i had rather be borne off like the bubble upon the dark blue ocean with ambulinia by my side than to have him in the ascending or descending line of relationship gentlemen continued he if alfonso is so much of a distinguished character and is so learned in the fine arts why do you not patronize such men why not introduce him into your families as a gentleman of taste and of unequalled magnanimity why are you so very anxious that he should become a relative of mine oh gentlemen i fear you yet are tainted with the curiosity of our first parents who were beguiled by the poisonous kiss of an old ugly serpent and who for one apple damned all mankind i wish to divest myself as far as possible of that untutored custom i have long since learned that the perfection of wisdom and the end of true philosophy is to proportion our wants to our possessions our ambition to our capacities we will then be a happy and a virtuous people ambulinia was sent off to prepare for a long and tedious journey her new acquaintances had been instructed by her father how to treat her and in what manner and to keep the anticipated visit entirely secret alfonso was watching the movements of everybody some friends had told him of the plot that was laid to carry off ambulinia at night he rallied some two or three of his forces and went silently along to the stately mansion a faint and glimmering light showed through the windows lightly he steps to the door there were many voices rallying fresh in fancy's eye he tapped the shutter it was opened instantly and he beheld once more seated beside several ladies the hope of all his toils he rushed toward her she rose from her seat rejoicing he made one mighty grasp when ambulinia exclaimed huzzah for major alfonso 
I will defend myself and you too with this conquering instrument I hold in my hand. Huzza, I say! I now invoke time's broad wing to shed around us some dewdrops of verdant spring. But the hour had not come for this joyous reunion. Her friends struggled with Alfonso for some time, and finally succeeded in arresting her from his hands. He dared not injure them, because they were matrons whose courage needed no spur. She was snatched from the arms of Alfonso with so much eagerness, and yet with such expressive signification, that he calmly withdrew from this lovely enterprise with an ardent hope that he should be lulled to repose by the zephyrs which whispered peace to his soul. Several long days and nights passed unmolested, all seemed to have grounded their arms of rebellion, and no calamity appeared to be going on with any of the parties. Other arrangements were made by Ambulinia. She feigned herself to be entirely the votary of a mother's care, and she, by her graceful smiles, that manhood might claim his term dominion in some other region, where such boisterous love was not so prevalent. This gave the parents a confidence that yielded some hours of sober joy. They believed that Ambulinia would now cease to love Alfonso, and that her stolen affections would now expire with her misguided opinions. They therefore declined the idea of sending her to a distant land. But, oh, they dreamed not of the rapture that dazzled the fancy of Ambulinia, who would say, when alone, youth should not fly away on his rosy pinions, and leave her to grapple in the conflict with unknown admirers. No frowning age shall control the constant current of my soul, nor a tear from pity's eye shall check my sympathetic sigh. With this resolution fixed in her mind, one dark and dreary night, when the winds whistled and the tempest roared, she received intelligence that Alfonso was then waiting, and every preparation was then ready at the residence of Dr. Tully, and for her to make a quick escape while the family was reposing. Accordingly, she gathered her books, went to the wardrobe supplied with a variety of ornamental dressing, and ventured alone in the streets to make her way to Alfonso, who was near at hand, impatiently looking and watching her arrival. "'What forms,' said she, "'are those rising before me? What is that dark spot on the clouds? I do wonder what frightful ghost that is, gleaming on the red tempest. Oh, be merciful, and tell me what region you are from. Oh, tell me, ye strong spirits, or ye dark and fleeting clouds, that I yet have a friend.' "'A friend,' said a low, whispering voice, "'I am thy unchanging, thy aged and thy disappointed mother. Why brandish in that hand of thine a javelin of pointed steel? Why suffer that lip I have kissed a thousand times to equivocate? My daughter, let these tears sink deep into thy soul, and no longer persist in that which may be your destruction and ruin. Come, my dear child, retract your steps, and bear me company to your welcome home." Without one retorting word or frown from her brow, she yielded to the entreaties of her mother, and with all the mildness of her former character she went along with the silver lamp of age to the home of candor and benevolence. Her father received her cold and formal politeness. "'Where has Ambulinia been this blustering evening, Mrs. Valier?' inquired he. "'Oh, she and I have been taking a solitary walk,' said the mother. All things, I presume, are now working for the best. Alfonso heard this news shortly after it happened. What, said he, has heaven and earth turned against me? I have been disappointed times without number. Shall I despair? Must I give it over? Heaven's decrees will not fade. I will write again. I will try again. And if it traverses a gory field, I pray forgiveness at the altar of justice." Desolate Hill, Cumming, Georgia, 1844. Unconquered and beloved Ambulinia, I have only time to say to you not to despair. Thy fame shall not perish. My visions are brightening before me. The whirlwind's rage is past, and we now shall subdue our enemies without doubt. On Monday morning 
when your friends are at breakfast they will not suspect your departure or even mistrust me being in town as it has been reported advantageously that i have left for the west you walk carelessly toward the academy grove where you will find me with a lightning steed elegantly equipped to bear you off where we shall be joined in wedlock with the first connubial rites fail not to do this think not of the tedious relations of our wrongs be invincible you alone occupy all my ambition and i alone will make you my happy spouse with the same unimpeached veracity i remain forever your devoted friend and admirer j l alfonso the appointed day ushered in undisturbed by any clouds nothing disturbed ambulinia's soft beauty with serenity and loveliness she obeys the request of alfonso the moment the family seated themselves at the table excuse my absence for a short time said she while i attend to the placing of those flowers which should have been done a week ago and away she ran to the sacred grove surrounded with glittering pearls that indicated her coming alfonso hails her with his silver bow and his golden harp they meet ambulinia's countenance brightens alfonso leads up his winged steed mount said he ye true-hearted ye fearless soul the day is ours she sprang upon the back of the young thunderbolt a brilliant star sparkled upon her head with one hand she grasps the reins and with the other she holds an olive branch lend thy aid ye strong winds they exclaimed ye moon ye sun and all ye fair host of heaven witness the enemy conquered hold said alfonso thy dashing steed ride on said ambulinia the voice of thunder is behind us and onward they went with such rapidity that they were very soon arrived at rural retreat where they dismounted and were united with all the solemnities that usually attend such divine operations they passed the day in thanksgiving and great rejoicing and on that evening they visited their uncle where many of their friends and acquaintances had gathered to congratulate them in the field of untainted bliss the kind old gentleman met them in the yard well said he i wish i may die alfonso if you and ambulinia haven't tied a knot with your tongue that you can't untie with your teeth but come in come in never mind all is right the world still moves on and no one has fallen in this great battle happy now is their lot unmoved by misfortune they live among the fair beauties of the south heaven spreads their peace and fame upon the arch of the rainbow and smiles propitiously at their triumph through the tears of the storm